Driving westbound, my brother and I were doing approximately 60 miles per hour on Route 224. Three fire trucks from the Odessa Montour Fire Department were coming in the opposite direction, lights and sirens on as they were responding to a call. Suddenly, this creature darts across the road from our left to right. It was illuminated by fire trucks and our headlights. I yelled to my brother, Don't hit that kid. That was when we realized that it was not a human nor an animal. We thought the lead fire truck was going to hit it. We believed it was spooked by the lights and sirens and panicked. It ran extremely fast on two legs, leaning slightly forward with what we estimated today to be a stride of five to six feet as the road was approximately 30 feet wide. It was completely blackened from head to toe, approximately six to seven feet tall. It swung its arms in an ape-like fashion at its sides, as if to gain momentum. Unlike the way a human pumps their arms and fists for speed when running, that's how we knew it was not a person. The creature did not look in either direction as it darted across the road. It acted like a scared animal. We returned to the site this morning and did not find any tracks. The ground was completely hard and dry at the time. No alcohol was involved. This sighting has stayed with me for a very long time. I didn't want to submit it at first, but based on the number of sightings identified, I am now moving forward with what I saw. My son and I were driving down County Road 200 in Liberty Hill, Texas. We came to the end and made a right turn on County Road 236. We were heading towards Killeen, Texas at the time. It was also in the morning. At the time, the car I was driving had two little plastic pieces on the front of it that were designed to create sound to scare away deer. I got them because my car was a small car. I didn't know if they would help. But as this is an area with a lot of deer, it was worth a try. I'm not sure if this is what scared what I saw. Just after what we made, the right on County Road 236, I saw what I thought was a gorilla on the left side of the road. It appeared agitated, and as we got closer, it ran across the road and climbed into a tree on the other side. At that point, I saw the tree move wildly with the leaves and branches swaying like it was extremely angry or like a strong wind had hit it. As the day was calm, the only thing that could have caused this was whatever jumped into the tree. I didn't look up. I didn't stop due to my son being with me. But that sighting has always remained with me, as it was so unusual. I've seen gorillas in the zoo, and it looked similar. I would say that it was relatively tall and was standing on its hind legs as I got closer to it. It raced across the street in front of us. It didn't seem as tall as I would have imagined, maybe six feet. It was hard to tell height from where I was in correlation to what I saw. After this event, though, I checked to see if a gorilla had escaped anywhere near me and didn't find anything. Too many. This will sound like a tall tale. But to me, it was very vivid. The only other thing I noticed is that I believed the little sound devices on my car are what caused it to come out and cross the street. I don't remember where I got them now, but I honestly believe that whatever sound came out of them while I was driving was what caused this creature to be so blatant about running across the road in front of us. Otherwise, it could have very easily stayed where it came from, and I would have completely driven by it without even ever knowing it was there. Through the years, I have had several sightings and interactions with what appears to be a Bigfoot and family. We own the better part of the Mystic Woods here, in Columbiana, Ohio. When the gas and oil companies began installing pipelines years back, we started having encounters. I'm an engineer by trade, 
and my wife is a banker. Tonight, yet another sighting by our pond. My wife and I were at dinner, and as we arrived home about 8.30 p.m., a very large, fast, gray, silver-light brown, covered in fur, of course, Bigfoot, darted from the bushes in our front into the cattails in our pond on all fours. We both looked at each other and said, Did you just see that? The subject was down low and bent in the middle as it moved. Unlike a dog, its undulating movement was not as fluid as a canine. It was not a bear. It appeared to be from four to five feet at the back and torso, built like a barrel. When it went into the cattails, we were no longer able to see it. It moved incredibly fast and was very large. This evening, I decided to venture out past the communication building as the foliage was still at ease. This was right around Oklahoma City, near a dirt road, actually by a dirt hiking path. So I continued another half mile up the path to where the power lines cross the river. From here, the river bank drops 15 feet, giving a nice view of the river below. As I approached this area, my eyes were immediately caught by someone down below at the river's edge. What I saw was an all-black figure down at the river edge, about 250 feet away. I thought it was strange. Not many people hike off the trail into the preserve during the summers, nor late in the evening, or ever even past the communication building. As I watched this man down at the river bank, I began to notice subtle little details, like golden red hair in the sunset. I also didn't notice any distinct clothing, but hair alone. At this moment, I remember being very confused as to what I was seeing. Whoever was down at the river began to walk inland using its arms to move the reed bushes. That is what I saw. I saw long hair dangling from its arm, shoulder to hand, and thought, Oh my gosh, it's a Bigfoot, I thought. Immediately, I began to reach for my phone without taking my eyes off of this thing. It immediately noticed me. What terrified me the most was I was not able to make out any details in the face as we made eye contact. That's when I ran. I continued to run until I met a couple with their dog back at the building. I'll never forget the look of confusion on their faces when I came sprinting around the corner. I wanted to tell them about my experience, but I continued to run as I thought they would not believe me. The following day, I returned to look for footprints, but was unable to venture into the overgrown foliage. The experience was not enough to scare me away completely. Instead, I was more cautious of the time of day and surroundings. I continued to exercise around here until I moved to Arizona in July of 2019. The week prior, I saw a homeless woman making camp in the woods. Her hair was messy, so I initially thought this was her at first. However, this was one mile downriver from where I saw the creature. I've also been told by my co-workers, as he knows I frequently walk the trails. There are other rumors of tree structures deep in the reserve, but these could have been built by teenagers who live in the nearby neighborhood, as I have seen many adolescents with their friends exploring the woods. Who knows, really, what I saw. Earlier this evening, June 5th, 2021, four of us were boating at the Salt Fork in Ohio. I live less than 10 miles, so I fished and boated out here for years. This evening, about 8 p.m., lake is very busy with several boats in the ski zone. We decided to take a break from the ski zone and headed back into a cove for a few moments. After going back about halfway into the cove, we all heard a very unusual sound come from our back left, which is a heavily wooded area. It was loud enough to hear over the motor. I shut off the engine so we could figure out what it was. The only way I can describe this sound is 
like an old mechanical tornado air raid siren that began to wind up. The sound had a very unusual, pronounced low in frequency, or bassy, in layman's terms. I mean, you could literally almost feel the sound. There are no sirens located out here. I've never heard a sound like that out here, or anywhere before. We've all heard stories of Sasquatch being out here, but I'm very skeptical of this stuff and joke about it usually on every single outing. I thought it was unusual, but Bigfoot was definitely not my first answer as to what we had heard. After we had got back home and kids in bed, I googled Bigfoot Air Raid Siren and eventually came across an audio clip called The Ohio Howl from the BFRO website. It's very close to sounding like what we heard, except ours was much closer to us. I want to share an experience my family and I had near Lake City, Colorado, on June 12th, 2021. We have visited Lake City for several years now. Well, several years in a row, I should say. Spending a week there each summer. One of our favorite places is Deer Lakes, about 15 miles southeast of Lake City, off of Highway 149. We always spend several evenings out there, fishing, cooking out, watching wildlife. Also, found in that area are two ponds known as the Upper Mill Pond, the nearest Highway 149, and the Lower Mill Pond, another mile or two down the road. On our way to Deer Lakes this visit, we stopped at the Upper Mill Pond to fish, but we saw a cow moose and two calves just below the pond eating in the runoff creek. We almost always see moose near Deer Lakes. While we were watching the moose from the cab of our truck, we heard the undisputable sound of a wood knock. At first, none of us thought much about it, until we heard another one. I was in the driver's seat, furthest away from the pond and moose. My daughter was in the back seat on the driver's side, while my wife was in the front passenger seat nearest the pond and moose. The girls thought the sound came from the direction of the pond, but I thought it came from the other direction. The pond and road to Deer Lakes sits in a valley between two ridges. The train line on the east, or pond side, is only about 100 yards away from the road, while the tree line to the east, or west, or opposite the pond, varies. In some places, a few hundred yards from the road and other places not far off at all, my daughter and I got out the cab of the truck to listen after we all heard the second knock. Then she and I both believed the sounds were coming from the west tree line. We waited, listening, and heard yet another knock. This time, seemingly from a different position from the first two. In a bit, another vehicle stopped to watch the moose. When they arrived, we heard another knock. A third vehicle drove past and we heard still another knock as it went by. In all, we heard what I would guess to be 8 to 12 knocks, from at least three different positions, but all on the west side of the road. My family and I talked about it. It was possible that there was a few guys in the woods making the sounds. Maybe one guy knocked on a tree, then another, and maybe another. It's possible. However, what sealed it as a Bigfoot for me happened later on that night. After we heard the knocks by the upper mill pond while watching the moose, we went on to Deer Lakes where we planned to fish, but our lines were too tangled. We did get to cook out, though. As the sun went down, we left Deer Lakes but drove further away from the highway, waiting until it got very dark before we went back to town so we could see the stars really well. Just off of Highway 149 on the road to Deer Lakes is a staging area for people to park trailers to unload their ATVs. There's also a forest department bathroom there. That is where we parked to stargaze. Now, as soon as we got out of the truck and shut the doors, we heard a knock from the east ridge of the mountains. This tree line is several hundred yards from the road 
It was not yet pitch dark. We could still make out the silhouette of the mountain against the backdrop of the sky. But it was too dark to make out any individual trees. I can't imagine any reason any person would be up on that ridge. At that time of night, in the dark, in the cold. Just waiting for the possible chance that somebody would stop at that staging area, get out of their vehicle, so they could hoax them with a wood knock. I believed, for sure, at the time that Bigfoot was in the area. In full disclosure, I am a Bigfoot enthusiast. I watch all the shows. I watch videos on YouTube. I have been a member of forums. But I live near Amarillo, Texas. It's flat, dry farmland. There is no Bigfoot hunting around there. I do always keep my eyes open when we visit the mountains or wooded areas. But this is my first experience of anything that I would contribute in any way to Bigfoot. On a related note, a few years ago on an earlier trip to Lake City and Deer Lakes, my family and I were getting ready to leave Deer Lakes. I had to visit the men's room before we drove back to town. So my wife and daughter were walking up to the path from the lakes to the parking lot. They heard what they described as an incredible crash, very loud and sudden, as an adult male moose was in the upper lake eating when the crash occurred. This moose was frightened so much that he raced out of the water into the woods, scaring my family terribly. When I came out of the restroom, they were at the truck and asked me if I had heard the crash. I had not heard anything somehow. They told me what had happened, and I instantly thought of Bigfoot pushing over a tree in the woods up from the lake. There was no way for us to know for sure. The girls certainly didn't want to go into the woods to investigate further, so we could possibly have had two Bigfoot encounters at or near Deer Lakes. I am almost positive we heard them knocking on June 12th, 2021. Thank you for your time, and sorry for rambling on so long about something probably insignificant, but it was my first encounter. I was pretty excited. Summer of 2020, the quarantine year. In late July, I was hiking with a friend along the Rio Chama. Although we were just on the other side of the river from town, the railroad was not running, the campground was closed, and the majority of the town was empty. This was a short day hike, as we are seniors. We had a dog accompanying us, a pit bull mix, for part of the way. Before we reached the river, we had to return the dog to the car. She became unusually excitable and fearful. Note, my friend and the dog live up in the mountain, and the dog is used to wildlife and has treed a bear before. Anyway, windows down and dog much happier. We returned to our walk. We had crossed the river, and we were on the trail that runs by the bank, this is when we first heard a series of hollow knocking sounds. These were loud and resonant, not woodpeckers or falling branches. A short time later, they were repeated at a distance, the knocks sounding lighter in tone, like a hit on a more solid wood. The knocks close to us responded, and we decided that it was in our best interest to leave the area. What myself and my brother-in-law found was a structure built of mainly blackberry vines. We were scouting for deer on an abandoned farm in an area that had been stripped for coal 35 years prior. This was by the Putney Ridge, actually not too far away from Cambridge in Ohio. Deer here were plentiful, but not as much as present day. When came across it, when we both were following a path that materialized and split in two directions around a spoiled bank. My brother-in-law went one way, and I the other. Both paths lead to the top of the spoil where we came on the structure. We were in total amazement, noting it was some kind of igloo shape with an opening to enter. The briars were woven together to form the walls, and the inside had been cleared like it had been mowed. We stood amazed at what could have made it. 
We had never heard much about a Bigfoot at the time. Nobody in their mind would have been in the area fighting thorny vegetation, biting insects to create such a thing. Then, about a month later, the same brother-in-law and his cousin were walking out of a hollow near dark when they heard the strangest animal they'd ever heard. When they would try and tell the family about it, that they just got laughed at, neither ever forgot it or entered the property in the dark. It wasn't until maybe 20 years later when I happened on a Bigfoot program, showing such a structure that a bell went off as to what we'd seen. Also, around the time, other people had reported seeing things peeking in windows around the county. Very strange sightings, if you ask me. This took place in North Carolina, Haywood County. Take 19 West out of Maggie Valley. Turn right on top of mountain towards Blue Ridge Parkway. Turn left on Parkway towards Cherokee. Pass first, pull off to the left to turn to Basalm Mountain Road. Towards Mason Monument. Before Monument, there's a pull off to the right where we were. Just before that, there's also a pull off to the left and the woods to the left. That is where the sound came from. So, Barb and I travel the road off the Blue Ridge Parkway to this trail several times a week when it is open. We are flower and wildlife junkies. Approximately one year ago, we were at the pull-off just before the Masonic marker, looking at fire pink flowers, when out of the blue, there was three tree knocks from across the road, very loud and very distinctive. There was nobody else around whatsoever, no wind either. We have noticed rocks that have fallen down the mountain and landed on the roadway, but no sign of where they had come from. Also, just as an article in the hot sheet, the sighting occurred after sunset May 30th near the Masonic Marker at Basalm Gap Camp, just off the Blue Ridge Parkway near Maggie Valley. It was getting very cold, so we got in the car, cranked the car up, and started back up to leave when this very dark figure ran across the road into the woods. It looked like a man. The hairs on my arm and back of my neck stood up, and I have never been so afraid of my life. Like I said, this was from an article. Pretty scary. Obviously, something lives around here. Well, I had a possible sighting today in the Shawnee National Forest. Not by me, sadly, but my wife. And believe it or not, she wasn't even a believer. Anyway, we were driving around from campground to campground, trying to find a spot to set up. Drove to campground, called Camp Cadiz. All campsites were occupied there, so we drove down this old road. It became too muddy to go any further, so we decided to turn around. And as I was dodging big potholes filled with water, we came around this bend, and she catches out of the corner of her eye, and she screams, Babe, don't hit that! And I'm like, what? Of course, I see nothing there. But she says there was something coming out of the wood line, trying to cross the road, but rain back in. She says it was black and brown, upright, and extremely large and tall. She says she still doesn't believe Bigfoot exists, but she knows she saw something she can't explain. This investigation was reported via phone, and the eyewitness gave his best to recollect the events that occurred on March 27, 2021, between 8 to 8.30 a.m. Prior to this event, he never gave a thought to a skunk ape or Bigfoot being anything other than folklore. On the morning of March 27th, he was preparing breakfast with his wife. The kitchen has a window that looks across their backyard. When he turned to ask his wife a question, movement outside the window caught his eye. He saw a dark bipedal figure walk from a group of trees toward a wooded area before disappearing from his line of sight. Now, he asked his wife if she had seen that, just as his eight-year-old granddaughter came running from the dining room 
yelling, Grandpa, did you see that? She had seen the figure as well from the back sliding glass door. She described it as big, and he admits that at first wondered what his neighbor was wearing, but realized it was taller than his 6'4 neighbor. He went on to describe the figure that was about 50 feet away, a slim build but tall. It was walking west to east, left to right, as they were looking north out the window. The family is very credible as to what happened that morning. It was obviously something they'd never seen, witnessed, or experienced before. When researching this area, it is not necessarily an area that one would expect to have this sort of activity. However, the homes are spaced out on one acre, or more lots, in some heavily wooded areas. His backyard connects to the Minnesota Scrub Preserve, which connects to agricultural and green areas, and then a state forest. Much of that area at the time of the sighting was very dry, without having had substantial rain for many months, which may have driven this animal towards water, and in this case, Forked Creek, which is across the street from this man's home. My son and I had just finished watching the sunset on the Blue Ridge Parkway at the Masonic Marker. We were still there watching the overview as a fog was rolling in. It was getting very cold, so we got in the car, cranked the car up, and started to back up and leave when this dark figure ran across the road into the woods. It looked like a man, but I turned towards the figure and couldn't see anything. It was entirely too large to be a black bear, and most definitely was not an elk. I haven't seen any at all this weekend. Again, the figure was very dark. The hairs on my arm and the back of my neck stood straight up. I have never been so afraid. My son reported seeing a large, two-legged figure, covered in fur, at approximately 8.30 p.m., July 18th, 2021, while driving eastbound on Pleasant Hill Road, roughly one and a half miles west of Highway 164 in Richfield, Wisconsin. The figure was standing right next to a tree on the south side of the road, close to the shoulder. The road here is curvy. He said he also caught eye shine, and the eyes were large. He said he probably saw this for about three seconds while driving. His headlights caught this, and he is 100% positive he saw something. He told me his heart dropped. He immediately called me while still driving. I knew something unique had happened based on his demeanor and tone. About 45 minutes after he called me, I met him at home, and we went back to the site with him. We brought our dog. Every time we stopped or approached this area where the sighting was, he began to whimper and would not get any closer. Something really spooked him. At around 11 p.m. on July 26th, my wife and I were night fishing on the backwater of Crane's Nest River in Dickinson County, Virginia. My wife's head was hurting, so she decided to take a nap. We had heard something large walking in the woods, but just wrote it off as a bear or deer, as both are plentiful in our area. She had been asleep for about an hour when I heard a large knock, about 50 yards up in the tree line. About 20 seconds later, several hundred yards up in the ridge, there was yet another knock. Both sounded as if somebody had taken a 4x4 post and struck a tree with it. Then, about 10 minutes later, there was a splash in the water about 20 feet away from our boat. This splash sounded like something weighing 20 or 30 pounds had struck the water, waking my wife. It's not unusual to hear large fish jumping at night, but this was different. After the splash, no more than a couple of minutes had passed, and there were two more knocks, and they were closer than the first one. We pulled anchor, reeled in our lines as we were leaving. We heard two more knocks. My wife told me she heard the knocks up on the ridge, but I didn't hear those. Just the sound of a large animal walking up the river, 
the same way we were traveling as if it was following us. When it came to a shallow cove where it would have had to swim through, we stopped hearing the walking sounds. This is the second time we encountered this animal. We also had an experience about a month and a half earlier, as we heard a large animal walking around and big splashes in the water, as if it were throwing things at us that night as well. Very strange. I was letting my dogs out to go to the bathroom before I left for work. It was roughly 3.30 a.m. I drive an hour to work and get there by 5, so that's why I wake up so early. All was quiet and peaceful. I heard a howl off in the tree line. Then, about five minutes later, I heard off in the distance something I had never heard before. I hear coyotes all the time. I've heard a bobcat screaming before, but this was far different. It sounded like it was quite always off, whatever it was, but sounded very big and very deep. The only way I can think to explain the noise was like a big burly man yelling, Ah! for about five to ten seconds long. Then nothing else. It caused a neighbor dog down the road to begin barking, but didn't seem to phase my own dogs. The direction that noise came from is about two to three miles of combinations of timber and farmland. Then it becomes a big river bottoms in the Grand River. I don't think whatever made the noise was two to three miles away. Maybe a mile at most. I have never heard anything like that before in my life. And I've been a very outdoorsy guy the entirety of my life. I've watched different Bigfoot shows and have heard vocalizations on them. And that's the closest thing I could think of of what this sounded like. However, I feel like recorded things on TV doesn't give me the same feel or power this thing seemed to have. I mean, it sent chills down my spine. It would have been closer. I definitely would have gone inside for a gun. No joke. The sighting was witnessed by my brother and a friend. My brother told me of the sighting shortly after it had happened in the winter of 1992. He has retold it to me a few times over the years. Most recently, on New Year's Eve, 98. The story is always the same and never changes. My brother was in high school at the time and had been at a party. The party was supervised by parents at a friend's house, so no drinking involved. His friend was driving the family in van. After the party, the two boys drove a girl home that lived west of Columbus and the Youth Camp Road area. Again, this is in Indiana. After dropping the girl off, the boys proceeded east on the road, back towards State Road 46. My brother states that something crossed the road, roughly 50 to 80 yards in front of the van. He claims it walked out of the woods on the left side of the road, crossed the road, and entered the woods again on the right. His claim is that the headlights caught a glimpse of it, as this thing was re-entering the woods on the right side of the road. He claimed it was completely white and furry. He said that they drove for about five minutes in silence without ever stopping. After about five minutes, my brother's friend said, what was that? And my brother said, I don't know. I was afraid to say anything because I thought it might have just been my imagination. According to my brother, this is the exact dialogue spoken, verbatim. He said it was big, tall, and covered in white fur. He told me that he didn't see it clear enough to tell if it was Bigfoot-like or humanoid, although he said it was roughly six feet tall and walking upright on two legs. I was 18 and a senior at Columbus East High School at this time period. There is a park directly across the street from my house. It was a warm spring night. I was doing a report for school and it was getting rather late. 
I was the only person still up at the time. I was, to my best guess, 1.30 a.m. I had just broken my last pencil, and I needed another one to finish my report. I had to go outside to get to my car to get one. I had just shut the door to my truck to go back inside when I hear the most god-awful shrill scream in my life. Turning around quickly, I can make out this vague outline of a large man-like creature running through the park and back into the woods. The scream lasted for roughly six seconds, and needless to say, I hightailed it back into the house. I explained to my parents in the morning. They said they had heard nothing, and that all I heard was probably a cat. Well, the next day, I pulled up a Bigfoot website and listened to some wave files, and the sounds that I heard were identical to what I had heard the previous night. I was walking our puppy at 2.30 a.m. Puppy training. We live directly across from Camp Atterbury, which is heavily wooded on our side. We also share it with Brown County State Park and Yellowwood. I was basically stargazing. I hear a loud howl type sound, and I've never heard it before. I grew up here, so I know what coyotes, wolves, foxes, owls, and even bobcats sound like. This was not any of those. I have never heard the sound from here. There was one short howl, and it sounded like it was right in front of me. I mean, no more than 140 feet. I moved a few paces to my right, and again, I heard the howl in front of me, as if it moved to the right with me. This time, after the second howl, there was about four or five short hoops after it. By that time, I was now really freaked out and ran back to my house. My husband and I rented a cabin in Nashville. We had just come down for a year to Indiana. Well, about 11 p.m., we went to bed. Within minutes, our dogs went nuts. My husband got up to check, opening the front door of the cabin. It is covered by a porch, and it was raining pretty hard. The porch light did not work, so it was pretty dark. He closed the door and told me to bring a flashlight and a firearm. I ran out of bed, went to him by the door. He said something was breathing heavy on the porch to the left of the door. At this point, it occurred to me that our dogs were strangely silent, being Akitas that have seen bear, wolf, coyote, and lynx all up close in Alaska. This was not normal behavior. My husband slowly opened the door again, and I was sure enough something was breathing very heavy to just open the side of the door. It also smelt. It was really strong. Musky, mixed with soggy old carpet and wet dog. We closed the door again while we chambered around, and I lit the flashlight. We did a tactical to the left where we heard the sound. It was gone, but wet footprints that looked like they were made with soggy, fuzzy bedroom slippers were across the floor. It had come across our front lawn and up the right side of the porch, across the door to the other side where we had heard it. The prints were close together while passing the first window, and the door, when it fled, it did it in one step. The footprints were a lot larger than my foot in slippers, which is a woman's 9.5 wide. I wondered if it realized what chambering around meant, since we had opened the door twice and it stayed, breathing heavy, right on the other side, right to the side where we couldn't see it. The dogs didn't scare it, and us two talking didn't scare it. That would indicate it had human interaction, maybe with hunters before. Not uncommon with bears in Alaska. A lot of people will chamber around, not wanting to hurt it, but ready to if it gets aggressive. They are smart and learn fast what that sound is. Another strange thing is that the dogs just paced around all night. They did not do this after confronting an 800-pound brown bear in Alaska, literally. They worked together and chased all the above away from around the home. We lived in a cabin off the grid. Not sure if we have a stinky homeless person 
wearing bedroom slippers, living in the woods. But it was very strange, and my husband was a career ranger. No one to let his imagination run wild. We were stumped. The dogs, two of them, pooped in the cabin. Something dogs are known to do when frightened, and these dogs are well housebroken. While backpacking near the horse trails and Axis Point in the county below Brown County, I experienced a confrontation with a bipedal primate. It was early March of 1998, and I was all alone. Around 7 o'clock in the evening, after hiking several miles, I set up camp in a wooded area, about 100 yards from the horse trail. Darkness was descending quickly, so... I was in a rush to set up camp and prepare my supper. After gathering firewood and getting my fire started for light and cooking, I suddenly began hearing leaves and brush rustling below me and to the east along a ravine that I camped above. At that moment, I thought to myself that it just was a bit early for mushroom hunters and probably too dark for them to see any. Perhaps it's a deer. Anyway. I grabbed my knife for protection, grabbing the flashlight cautiously, and approached the ravine where the noises were coming from. I yelled out in the direction of the sounds and aimed my flashlight. To my astonishment, I viewed a very tall, upright human-looking being hiding behind a clump of trees close to the stream. The creature stood about seven feet tall, as I could see his silhouette from the left side of the trees. He was leaning forward and exposing his head to view me. He, or it, was approximately 40 feet from my position, and the light from my flashlight shined into its eyes. I could see that he had dark hair covering his cone-shaped head and dark eyes in the front of his skull. I knew immediately that this couldn't be a man. Now, I was very frightened. Yelling out again, in hopes of scaring it off. It ran into the stream and away from me, from about six feet before ducking behind another tree. I continued to follow him with my flashlight, screaming at him with threats. Now, this went on for two to three minutes before he took off running down the creek again, out of sight. The rest of the night, I stayed awake near my campfire, fearing a return visit waiting for daylight to return to my truck. I would have packed out that night, only my truck was in the direction that the hairy biped fled, and I was miles in. This entire situation was very frightening to me. I always thought that if Bigfoot existed, it would be in the Cascades or the Canadian Rockies. I never would have imagined it being here. Scary. June 17th, 2013, Salt Fork State Park Bigfoot Ridge. Me and my girlfriend went to bed at about 10 p.m. Off and on, we heard really weird loud screams. At about 1 in the morning, she woke me up in terror because whatever it was making the noise was now outside her tent, just feet from our heads, pulling handfuls of grass. She was frozen with fear and waited for it to walk away. When it did, she opened the tent where she heard twigs cracking, shining the flashlight in that direction when she saw its really big yellow eyes. They were close together, and it turned towards the wooded tree line. We believed it watched us grab our stuff and end the trip early. We left our tent and hauled it out of there fast. We were completely traumatized over the experience and would like to talk to somebody who believes. We also believed we attracted it because I was knocking on trees just after sunset. We were told there were no other people supposed to be in the area, camping, but it looked like they left early also, leaving camping gear behind. It was just the two of us. And as for the environment, it was next to the marsh, a quiet and clear night. One thing to note is that all the frogs in the area had stopped making noise, all at once. And my dog was also acting weird, 
would not come out of the Jeep. A follow-up investigation report was done by an investigator by the name of Mark DeRath. After interviewing the main witness and having multiple conversations, I'm convinced that in fact something did occur that night on and around the campsite. The fear and tone of their voices while recounting the experience was quite compelling. She was awakened by something walking around their tent, making a sound similar to tearing out long grass. She listened for a short period of time while trying to wake up her boyfriend by nudging him. The walking sound became faint and then became quiet. She opened the tent door, crawled out with a flashlight on, and in hand scanning the surrounding area while on all fours. Towards the wood line, there was an area of tall reeds that led up to the forest. When her light shined in that direction, she clearly saw two large yellowish golf ball-sized eyes looking in her direction, standing in the reeds. Within seconds, the large eyes turned towards the forest and disappeared, making just a little noise on its departure. After seeing and hearing this, she panicked, abruptly awakening her boyfriend to the point that they both became quite concerned on what was out there. The boyfriend, who was six foot five, shined the flashlight in the woods and had his sidearm, he had a concealed carry permit, ready while his girlfriend went to get their vehicle and drive it back to the campsite. He could hear the footfalls at what he estimated was a hundred feet into the woods. Once there, they quickly threw everything in the vehicle, drove straight home at around two in the morning, leaving their belongings and their tent behind. And they were the only tent at the primitive campground and were very shaken up by the whole experience. They joked around earlier in the evening and made wood knocks since the campground was called Bigfoot Ridge. I asked the witness if the eye shine was a possible owl, and she said absolutely not. She could faintly hear it walk away when it turned towards the wood line and stated there were no trees within 30 feet from where she could see it standing. She also stated that compared to her rather tall boyfriend, the thing she saw was much taller and most definitely whiter. They also had a dog with them, but noted it was acting quite strange while tied up close to the wood line. After watching the dog's behavior, they all decided to put the dog in the vehicle before they went to bed. The dog did not bark the entire night once in the vehicle. Sunday. I was a vendor at Creature Weekend at Salt Fork State Park on May 4th. At around 9.45 p.m., a fisherman that was in a tournament came in all shaken up and said that, at first, I thought you guys were a bunch of nuts, until now. So, he began to tell his story to the other vendors. So, this grabbed my attention. I went over to listen, and there were about five of us that decided to go out the next morning, at about 6 a.m., to check out the site. So, I got there at 5, waited, and said to myself, if they are not here by 5.30 a.m., I'll start without them. Maybe they will catch up with me. So, I started to head down the sagebrush trail, headed to where he got the picture. The wind was from my left to right, and the sun was on my left shoulder, halfway down the path. Two deer must have smelt me, because they were on my right, and started running. So, I kept walking, and the sun started to come up, and when I hit the first turn on Sagebrush Trail, I heard something like talking on the ridge on my left. At first, I thought it was friend A and friend B, with friends A's black shirts on. So, I hit a tree, and yelled, Hey guys, wait up! Then, they started to walk faster, and I yelled, Very funny guys. This is when I got a great look at them. Then, I knew what I was looking at on the ridge. It was two Bigfoot creatures. They were black and very huge. I tried to catch up with them, get a picture with these things, and they were walking fast. Once they get to the bottom of the ridge, they took off into the brush, but I did manage to get a whole good picture of them. You can see in the picture, the one turned to look to see if I was trying to follow them 
When the one turned to look back, he had to turn his whole top half of his body, with his left arm, going across his chest to look back at me. I tried to follow them, but once they got in the brush, I could not hear or see them. But I got a great look at them, and they were black as coal. The hair length was as long as a bear, and surprisingly well-groomed. At any time, they could have stopped and tore me in half, but all they wanted to do is get away as fast as possible. The other thing I noticed, or the only other thing, that made me look up on the ridge was I heard something like somebody talking, but I could not make it out. It sounded like somebody outside your home talking, but again, it just sounded like muffled noise, kind of like an 8-track tape player that was eating the tape. I did not smell anything like wild animal, but this could be because the wind blowing on top of the ridge. I searched for footprints of hair samples, but they came up empty-handed. A follow-up investigation report was done by investigator Mark Mazel. A site visit was performed on this area in June 15th, 2013, and the following can be added to this report. The sighting took place on Shade Brush Trail in Salt Fork State Park. It was about three-fourths of a mile down the two-mile trail. At the point of first seeing these animals, the witness was approximately 200 feet away, on a ridge that was most likely cleared of brush. When I went to that spot, he stated that they were much bigger than myself. I'm about six feet tall. He also stated to me that they made me look small. The two animals were dark in color, and the witness describes them as huge. The witness described the long arms, longer than a human. Their walk and gait was weird, as they were sort of squatting as they walked. The closest that he was to these animals was upon the initial sighting. The witness was not able to discern any specific features. He simply was not close enough. He did note that the hair was not matted and had a very slight shine to it. When the animal turned to look at the witness, the animal turned its entire body. The witness also did not notice a neck and describes the turning motion as stiff. We moved to this location two years ago. We only lived here a few weeks, and my four-year-old came running into the house and said he didn't want to play outside anymore. He seemed upset, but not extremely frightened. When I asked him what was wrong, he said he saw a monkey man looking at him through the trees. I went out there, and nothing was there. I searched around the area, but didn't see anything. My son took me to the tree and showed me where someone or something was looking at him, between a fork and the tree. That was two years ago. Yesterday, my oldest son, aged 15, was standing in the living room, glanced out the picture window. He says that something huge and black ran from some trees we have there besides the garage. I was kidding and said, is it Bigfoot? And very seriously was like, yeah, I think it is. I ran out the back door, which is toward the opposite side of the garage than where whatever it was would be standing. I ran behind the garage and to the other side, but nothing was there. I live near a heavily wooded area, and the woods are close to the house, behind and to one side of it. The garage blocks the view of the yard, and you can only see the front side from the window. Whatever it was would have had plenty of time to run into the woods. Tonight, my son's friend Bobby was visiting for the night and was outside getting things ready to build a fire when he called my husband from his cell phone to the house. He thought my husband or son was playing a trick on him to try and scare him. He told him to come out, and when my husband went out to him, Bobby told him something big was running from the tree to tree, looking at him. He said it was black, and even though it was dark, he saw the outline of the face, which is why he thought it was my husband or son. This would have been about 40 feet, ending to 20 feet away from him. He said it came from the right outside the tree line, from the yard, and then went into the tree line, running 
from tree to tree, looking at him, getting closer. Like it was trying to hide from him, but still keep an eye on him. When my husband came out, Bobby turned away to ask him if my son was playing the joke. When he turned back, it was gone. They came in and told me, so we went out with the camera, took some pictures of the woods in the dark. I don't know if I got anything or not. Whatever it is, from descriptions given to me, it's about 6 to 6'4", six and since everybody says it's about the size of my husband or son, husband is 6 and a half, and son is 6'2". Note, the porch light was on, and you could see the edge of the tree line because of the light. My cat that hardly ever leaves the deck has now disappeared. I attribute it to the old age thing, though because she was about 14, after all. But she was fine the night before when I fed her, and she does not ever disappear. She always sticks right by the house. There were no other witnesses. My youngest was playing on the deck. My oldest was standing in our living room, talking to his father and I. Bobby, my son's friend, was trying to get a fire started. There is also a big field leading into about 80 acres of woods. My house, remember, sits with woods very close to one side, with about four acres of open yard on the other side leading to more woods, then the highway. Across the highway, there are more woods. Close to the back of my house are woods that go back roughly 700 feet, then hit a huge field, then to more woods. There is a house way back in the woods, but nobody really lives there, and they are only there for a few weeks out of the year. I cannot see the house from mine. There are maple, oak, pine, and ash trees. I am the only house on this side of my street, with only a few houses on the opposite side spaced very far apart. A follow-up investigation report was done by investigator Mark Mazel. I performed a site visit to this area on August 7th and 12th, spoke to both of the witnesses. The following can be added to these reports. Both witnesses described the animal as being six and a half to seven feet tall. The very first witness describes the animal as muscular, as his sighting happened at around three in the afternoon. The second witness again was unable to describe the animal's build, partly due to it taking place at around 10.30 at night. Both witnesses described the animal to have had a pale face and hands. Both also described the head shape as round. The witness, the first one, stating that it did not have facial hair. The second states that the animal did not have a neck, while the first one did not notice it. Witness 1 describes the animal's arms as long, with large hands that were facing rearwards. Witness 1 observed the animals from a bay window on the side of the house that was approximately 50 feet from this animal. The second witness saw the animal from approximately 100 feet away, and saw the animal near the woodline. The second witness did state that, as the animal was leaving, he did hear one knock as it was heading further into the forest. The very first incident lasted only about 30 seconds in total duration, the second lasting about two minutes as the witness was trying to figure out what he was seeing. Both described the animal as only moving on two feet. Both state that the animal headed into the wood, east. The second witness was unaware of what had transpired the previous day when his sighting had occurred. Further examination of the area provided the following information. The area runs along an interstate highway. The woods behind the house open into a large field, followed by more open woods. Further back, another field opens up, and then again, more woods are present. Eventually, this will lead to a house. There is actually a drainage area to the south of the house that leads to a creek that crosses under the highway. Signs of movement were abundant in the woods, with deer and raccoon prints being seen very often. Actually, a deer carcass was observed near the road, as was a possum near the south woodline. No other footprints were found. The household also throws their peelings and spool of food out into the woods. That attracts animals. The cat has still not shown up at the residence. Farms and a horse barn are nearby, 
as was the abundance of wild berries. I live in Lake Helen, Florida, and we have had several incidents that I didn't put together until I ran across the story of the recent sightings. My daughter and I share our home with two golden retrievers. It's not uncommon for my female to not want to go outside due to her nightly business for no apparent reason. Now, maybe there is. My daughter and I were in my bedroom around 9 p.m. one night when something slapped the side of the house so hard that it shook it. We looked around from inside but saw nothing. Three days later, at about three in the morning, my daughter in her bedroom, directly above my bedroom, sharing the outside wall, woke up to a loud house shaking slam, following by a loud growl. Her feet hit the floor upstairs at the same time mine hit the downstairs. We assumed it was just a bear, but never could figure out why a bear would hit the house and how it could hit hard enough to shake the entire house waking us up both. This was shortly after February, in the wintertime. There were also reports in the adjacent area, which is a community within Lake Helen. Where this happened was within walking distance of each other, and the adjacent areas there have been other sightings. I don't recall any specific weather conditions, but I can tell you it was pitch black outside. First time was around 9 p.m., and second around 3 there was actually a follow-up investigation. The witness and her daughter live in Lake Helen, an area that has a rich history of Sasquatch activity. In fact, there was so much activity that in the 70s that the town now refers to the creature as the Mole Man. The witness is aware of the Mole Man's stories, but hasn't put much faith in them until recently. On the night of February 24th, 2013, Around 9 p.m., the witness and her daughter were getting ready for bed. Both were in the bathroom, talking, when something hit the side of the house. It was so loud and powerful, the wood frame of the house shook. Thinking someone might be trying to break in, they turned on all the outside lights, looked through the windows, and saw nothing, but called the police. The police looked around outside with flashlights, did not find anything. A few nights later, at about 3 a.m., they were both awakened by another house shaking slam to the house, followed by a loud, deep growl. In both cases, the house slam came from the same area, just under the master bedroom window. I spoke with the witness, then visited her property shortly after the incidents. The property is just about a half a mile from the 1970s Mole Man Orange Grove reports. It is just over a mile away from the Mole Man reports from the summer of 2012. That is in a separate report. The property is heavily wooded, as is the entire area. A power line road runs alongside the backside of her property. She has a compost pile that she adds leftover food to, several berry trees, and has never had anything like this happen in the many years she has lived there. Me and my buddy were out in the woods hunting in Pearson, Florida, on Nine Mile Road. We were driving out, and I noticed something big and brown in the ditch on the side of the road, crouching down. Then it stood up, and walked back and forth across the road. Then, crouching back down, we know for a fact it wasn't a human. It seemed to be about 9 feet tall. It was about 5.30, 20 minutes before dark. In fact, there was also another follow-up investigation on this report. The man who spoke with the hunter, who was an avid outdoorsman, about his late afternoon sighting. He was hunting with a friend, but his friend went off in another direction. And then this occurred, so he was alone at the time of this sighting. The hunter was hog hunting in a very heavily wooded wildlife management area near Lake George. He heard bushes rustling, turned, and saw a human but ape-like face and shoulders squatting behind bushes. The gentleman has seen bear in the area 
and knows what he saw was indeed not a bear. It was 15 to 20 yards away, and when the creature was standing, it was much taller than his 6'5 frame. He estimates more like 8 to 9 feet. It had a flat nose, not like a human, but seemed to have other humanoid features. He watched it for a minute and a half behind the bushes before it stood again, turned and quickly walked away on two legs, towards the swamp. It was dark brown, mixed black hair and color. Heavy foliage blocked him from getting a better view of the creature's lower body, when it briskly walked away. Heavy footsteps could be heard. It did not vocalize. The hunter smelt an odor, similar to that of a wild hog odor, but much stronger and heavier during the encounter. He was hunting in that place because of the smell. He thought there was hog in the vicinity. After the creature walks away, the hunter left the area too. It was startling, at least for him. And although he had a gun, the creature's size was intimidating and he did not wish to investigate further. The area of this encounter was in Lake George State Forest, which is part of two wildlife management areas with more than 20,000 acres of virgin longleaf slash pine, bald cypress, and other bottomland hardwood hammock forests. During the wet season, there are also marshy floodplain areas, along with this national forest. This joins part of a network of protected lands, forming a wildlife corridor and roaming habitat for Florida black bear. Other species of wildlife that call the area in the vicinity home include white-tailed deer, turkey, bobcat, and of course, feral hog. There is currently another encounter that is being investigated in the same area. It is safe to say that Sasquatch or skunk ape activity is well and alive. A friend and I were fishing late into the night and early morning in a remote area between Ormond Beach and Flagler Beach next to a small bridge on Walter Boardman Lane. The friend of mine noticed a set of eyes shining in the woods while looking down a very small trail. We were wearing headband-style flashlights, and he told me to go check it out. As I looked down the trail, it was very obvious to me that the eyes were far enough apart and high enough off the ground to justify being concerned. I convinced myself and my friend that whatever it may be, it's more afraid of us than we are of it. A while later, maybe 20 minutes or so, he mentioned that it was still there staring at us. I walked slightly closer to the opening of the trail in an attempt to make out what it may have been, but still couldn't tell. A few minutes goes by, the same thing. It was still there and still staring towards us. I tried to make noise and decided to yell at it. It apparently wasn't too concerned because it didn't so much as blink or move. We again convinced ourselves that it was nothing to be afraid of. We continued with fishing, and not long after, my friend notices that it had finally moved on. We thought nothing more of it until I got the biggest scare of my adult life. As I was standing there, something let out the deepest, slowest growl that I have ever heard in my life. It sounded as though it was standing directly behind me and very close. I turned to look at my friend and the look on his face told me that I was certainly not hearing things. Without a second thought or even a spoken word, we drop our fishing poles and run as fast as we could to the truck. We jumped in, locked up tight. My first question was if he had heard it and his response was, yeah, what was that? We were so scared that we weren't sure what to do. The decision was made a couple of minutes later to start the truck, turn on the headlights. He raced the engine, blew the horn repeatedly. Even after a few moments of doing this, and feeling sure that whatever it was had to have left the area, we were still very hesitant to retrieve our fishing gear. After a long while of deciding, we very quickly jumped out, threw our things into the back of the truck, and left. 
We had both lived in Florida for some time. We spent a lot of time on the water and in the woods, fishing, camping, all in remote locations. Never before, never have I heard anything like that. I can say for a fact that 100% it was not an alligator or a bear. Beyond that, I have no idea. I do know whatever it is may have been convinced two grown men, both of them to immediately go out and purchase handguns to carry during each and every future outing. Not sure where the sound clips of the growls come from on the Finding Bigfoot television series, but they're about the closest thing I've heard of to the sound I heard that night. The only other detail that stands out to this day is that we had a buffet of shrimp, chicken gizzards, and livers, cut up fish sitting on the tailgate of the truck. On the 19th of May 2007, at around 8.30 a.m., my wife and I were on our way to the local bait shop on the Flagler County line in Central Florida. Our usual route to the shop at Highbridge Road is via Old Dixie Highway through Walter Boardman, also known as The Loop. I was turning left off Old Dixie onto Walter Boardman, and I looked ahead on the road and saw two vehicles approximately half a mile in front of me on Walter Boardman. At that instant, behind the vehicle closest to me, I saw a tall, dark figure on two legs swiftly cross the road from south to north. The figure that I saw was taller than the vehicle ahead of it, and it appeared to cross the road in three or four stiff-legged strides. I said to my wife, Did you see that? She replied that she had not, as she was looking for something in her purse. By that time, whatever it was, was already in the woods. So I sped up to reach the area where the figure crossed the road. My wife and I scanned the entirety of the woods where it had disappeared, saw no trace of it. I knew right away, though, that this was not a regular animal or man. It was extremely tall, dark and fast, although it did not appear to be running. The strides covered a great distance. We continued towards our destination and had arrived at a plantation, a state park where we fish. I won't mention the name. We mentioned what I had seen to the ranger who dismissed it as a simple black bear. I disagree. It was lean and too fast to be a bear walking on hind legs. I wish that I could have gotten a better look up close, but I have and will continue to look carefully as I drive the loop for another sighting of this very interesting creature. A follow-up investigation report was done. This witness saw a tall, dark figure cross the road, right after a red pickup truck that was a half a mile ahead of it passed it. The figure was approximately two to three feet taller than the truck and walked bipedally on two legs, the estimated height to be around seven to nine feet tall. He has lived in such areas like Alaska and is very familiar with seeing bears. He firmly stated that this was not a bear sighting. The witness has visited this location several times to look for evidence, but with no success. The Plantation Ruin State Park is 150 acres through the Bulo Creek, travels before it empties in the Tomaca Basin. The park is a part of the Greenway Corridor that connects the nearby North Peninsula Recreation Area on the coast. The sighting occurred in a high elevation park meadow in the Fan Creek drainage in Yellowstone's northwest corner. The first time I had heard anything was in the mid-late 70s. An outfitter and I were riding up Fan Creek in the northwest section of the park, up the drainage into Stellaria Creek. We heard a sound that just kept going and going. It was probably a mile away. It filled the entirety of the valley, kind of a thousand-like elk going to their death. I couldn't believe this thing had that much volume for that long a period of time. He had never heard anything like it, neither. A couple of weeks later, I was coming out from Sportsman Creek, taking a trail which comes out of Fan Creek. 
I was eleven miles back in, up high in supple pine for a meadow complex. I was on a steep side hill with horses and in woods, but down below, about forty to fifty yards, there was a kind of fairly flat meadow with dense thickets. There were these low fir growths that have a centerpiece tree, and then everything kind of cone shapes to ground. They were about twenty yards wide or so. The horses were flaring their nose and snorting, like they do when a grizzly bear is real close. But I could see fairly good all around, and I could not see one. So I began looking down below me, and the horses were really agitated. They're wanting to get out of there. I held them, but only with effort. I looked down to see where Grizz was, and I saw a deer at the edge of the thicket. All at once, it bolted, and started jarring ahead, perpendicular to me. Right then, coming out of the other side was this thing that was running on two feet. It was black like a bear, and it had long arms and ran. I think I held it there thirty seconds, but it got scared and then came out. It ran, but not super fast. It ran to another thicket, and went at an angle out of the thicket to another thicket, about forty to fifty yards away. At this point, the creature was seventy-five yards downslope. It kept hitting these thickets, trying to get away from me. I've never seen a bear do that. They'll always take a straight line. The first thing I thought was bear, but right away. I realized that this black, shaggy thing wasn't a bear. This thing was smart. I have never seen an animal trying to pick up protection as it fled. I tied that together with sound on the other side of the drainage. It wasn't that tall either. It looked like it was six foot, maybe six five. The side of the face looked like it had a lot of fur, and most of the time, it was angling away. So I only got a good look at the head, for probably the first ten steps. The proportions of the torso, it looked more stocky than anything else. I noticed the arms swung more than a human's would, and it did not have elbows cocked. This was no hoax. I've ridden maybe fifty thousand to seventy thousand miles in the backcountry on horses, and trust me, you encounter a lot of bears when you do that. This thing, whatever it was, the horses looked straight down to it. One guy I had met in the northeast section of the park, he was camped illegally. He said he had heard a noise really close to him. I made him describe it to me. He said it was probably within twenty yards. One other outfitter heard that also. That would be back in the early eighties for both of those. Another time. A crew examining the blister rust, which is a disease of white bark pine in the 1970s, came on an elk in the southeast corner of the park. They came on an elk, and saw these big, real footprints. They kind of got scared and headed out. On that same trip, they heard really weird noises up near Mountain Creek. One time, I was skiing into Heart Lake on the thoroughfare. We were five or six miles east of the road, and myself and the others, all at once, we saw these footprints going across the trail. There wasn't any path, and no one used to ski that far in back then. These were real big footprints and stretched out far apart. It was deep snow, but it was a fairly distinct track. That was the first and only track I've seen. In the early mid '80s, in some drainage as Mountain Creek, we were just coming into the Howl Creek cabin near Eagle Creek Pass, at 8,500 feet. We were coming in right before dark, and we heard that noise. I timed it at 26 seconds, about 300 to 400 yards beyond the cabin up the drainage. I checked the next day, couldn't find any footprints. Whatever that thing is. It doesn't let up to take a breath. As far as the sounds, it's mechanical, rhythmical. I can't even begin to describe it. 
It isn't like a mountain lion or a bear, and a bear can make some pretty weird noises. I heard no other reports of Bigfoot until three to four years ago. I was in Mountain Creek and heard this thing again. A district ranger once took sighting from a backpacker near Balula Lake. That would have been in the 70s, west of the south entrance. Apparently, the person watched one on the other side of a small lake for 10 minutes. The ranger felt the witness was very sane. The sighting was witnessed by my friend and myself, both geologists, while driving into Yellowstone from Cody for employment at the park for the summer. My friend was taking his turn at driving, and I was soaking up as much as I could see, as well as providing a running commentary to keep my friend alert during our very long drive. As we came around a curve in the road, our high beams illuminated a large, dark, shaggy figure coming up out of the ditch on the left south side of the road at a distance of roughly 200 to 250 feet. As we approached the figure at a speed of about 45 miles per hour, it looked first at the vehicle. We noticed the yellow reflection from its eyes that is seen in dog's eyes when light catches it at night then deliberately turned its head away from the lights. That motion was non-human or bear-like, in that the shoulders, chest, and head moved simultaneously as it caught sight of our vehicle, then turned its face away from the headlights. We slowed. Okay, we slammed on the brakes, stunned at what we were seeing and tried to rationalize what we were looking at. A hominid creature perhaps seven and a half feet in height. We have a seven-foot friend as a reference, massing perhaps 600 to 800 pounds without obvious signs of obesity, standing completely and comfortably upright, came up out of the ditch from the left side of the road, right at the edge of the metal barrier above the culvert. It took three extraordinarily long and fluid strides across the highway, which is measured at 22 feet, and another three to four shorter strides down the other side of the road, actually appearing to catch hold of the metal barrier with one long, fingered, hairy hand, and swinging down under the road into the box culvert, or channel bottom, completely out of our line of sight. We stopped the vehicle within 25 feet of the culvert and watched as the final descent of the creature went off into the darkness of the channel. At this point, we sped on towards the east gate of YNP, hoping to find a ranger to report the sighting to, perhaps to go back and take another look. There was no one at the gate due to the late hour. We didn't see any lights on anywhere, so we continued on to our destination, went to bed, deciding not to contaminate each other's observations with discussions until morning time. In the morning, we both independently described graphically and in writing as much as what we could have seen six hours earlier. This is a synopsis of our findings. They were virtually identical, down to the movement of which leg moved first as the creature crossed the road. The head appeared to merge into the neck, and there was no snout or protrusion from the face as would be commonly seen in a bear. Trust me, I've seen hundreds, up close and in person. This was not some misidentity. The face was not clearly visible and was only glimpsed for a moment. We both got an impression of long hair covering some of it. The nostrils were large and open, but neither of us were able to describe mouth or teeth. The eyes weren't exceptional, just the reflection of gold like a dog's. What each of us can still describe, with great clarity in the size, shape, and unique fluid movement of the creature. It was big, seven to seven and a half feet tall, but not much bigger than that. It was heavy and powerful looking. In shape, it possessed a rather blocky, yet elongated head, 
slightly domed on top of the cranium, thick, short neck, broad shoulders, full chest. It was square, and longer through the torso and hips than a human is. As it walked across the road in front of us, the buttocks was clearly seen as a muscular mass moving under heavy, shaggy hair. They obviously attached to a long, powerful, muscular thighs, longer in proportion to a human, big knees that functioned as a human knee, thick, muscular calves, and feet in proportion to the rest of its oversized body. The soles of the feet appeared to be hairless, or less hair covered in hair, and very dark in color. The arms hung from heavily muscled shoulders and were longer than a human, reaching to knee length and extending fully, almost a horizontal position to the front and rear of the body as it moved. The elbows were perhaps a little further down the arm than on a human, or the unusual length of the arm made it appear so. The hands were large and long-fingered, Neither of us could later describe the palms, nails, or other than the backs of the hands which were covered in the same long, shaggy, dark brown hair as the rest of the creature. The creature made no sound nor gesture through the entire sighting. It appeared a little startled at our vehicle, appearing out of the night, but in no other way frightened or threatening. Startled the heck out of the two of us, though. I have never seen anything like it. This was also around 1.45 in the morning. Weather conditions were very clear, calm and cool. The night was very dark, with only starlight, and the headlights of our vehicle on high beam providing any light or illumination. I have no personal knowledge of other sightings of this nature in this particular area. This happened in Yellowstone Park, on the east entrance into the park, coming from Cody, Wyoming direction. At the base of the mountain, the road crews had huge gravel piles that they were using in building this new road. I was looking up the mountain to see if I could spot bighorn sheep, as we had seen grizzly, and many other of the Yellowstone animals while driving the loop of the park. I immediately noticed at one on the side of the mountain, nearest a top large triangular patch of snow, and walking in strides, a tall and eight to nine foot hairy, upright, bigfoot-like animal. It was so tall that you couldn't help but not see it. Then, it made three strides across this rocky terrain, and stopped just above a green grassy-like area next to the snow. My son saw the same sight as I, because he was excited, saying that it looked and walked like Chewbacca, the Star Wars character. Even though it was so high above us, you could make out what it was. I'm only sorry that we couldn't stop and pull off, but the traffic was fast, and nowhere to pull off because of road crews. As we're driving out of the park, there was a lot of road construction involving the park roads. The work crews were all along the area in which I saw it high up, on the side of the mountain. There was a snow. I would like to know if there have been sightings of this thing in the area before. The flag girl on the roadside was not aware of any sightings, but I'm interested to find this out. Since my husband was driving, he was unable to see it, but my younger son saw the same sight as myself. Me and my brother and our cousin, 11, 10, and 12 years old at the time, we all used to frequent a neighborhood across from ours called the Acorn Circle. It was a heavily wooded area that only had about three homes at the time. On the southeast side of this neighborhood, there were no homes at all, and was especially a favorite spot of ours to play, since it had a few curiosities about the area. Just to describe the location a bit, this wooded area had a very nice canopy of trees and was somewhat darkened, even in the bright Florida daylight. There was this large mound of eroded dirt that had a patch of sunlight directly coming through the tree canopy. 
about 15 feet away, there was a very large drainage ditch that was about 5 feet across and 4 feet deep. Somebody, at one time or another, had placed a log across this ditch in order to cross it. On the other side, there was an old VW bug and van that had been there so long, small trees were actually growing up and through them. Further back from this was the scarce remnants of a burned-down house. We rarely explored back further than this due to the ever-increasing darkness, heavy foliage, and swampiness. On the day this sighting occurred, my cousin and myself were playing on the dirt mound with our matchbox cars while my brother explored just a short distance away to the left of us and the Volkswagens. Suddenly, we were jolted to the sound of a loud crack as if somebody had stepped on a stick. We immediately looked to the direction of the Volkswagens where the sound had come from. There, approximately 10 feet to the right of them, was a large human-like figure. I roughly estimate that it was around seven feet tall. Its color was not really distinguishable due to the poor lighting. Its right side was slightly obscured by some small trees on the bank of the ditch. We stared at it for roughly a minute or so, then began conversing with each other, wondering who or what this thing was that was just standing there watching us. I remember one of us supposing it was a bear standing up, but that was quickly batted down, since its shoulders were clearly visible. It simply looked like a large hairy man. None of us recall seeing a face or any other clear details, considering that all that was really visible was a jagged, hairy silhouette against the dimly lit woods. At one point, I remember saying, I bet it's Bobby an older teenager that lived in that neighborhood, trying to scare us. So I shouted, Hey Bobby, stop playing around. We know it's you. But no response. Then one of us yelled out, Okay, you can come out now. Stop trying to scare us, whoever you are. Again, no response. As we continued to stare, it slowly moved slightly to its left, fully exposing itself from behind that small clump of trees. As it moved, it raised its left hand up and outwards in order to grab a tree branch, while at the same time leaning forward as if to get a better look at us. My brother said that when it did this, from that particular angle, he could see long hair dangling off its arm. At this point, we all ran as fast as we could, and we have never returned to that spot ever since that day. This was back in August of 1981, near a wooded area in Sarasota. This occurred in Northport, Florida, back in the summertime of 1999. My wife and I are sleeping, and about 2 a.m., we both woke up, heard something outside the window. We were living at the time on the backside of the Miyaka State Park. This area of the state park is very desolate, very isolated. Besides your regular wild animals, the only other thing that would be walking around would be your Florida marijuana grower in the swamps out here. My wife and I have lived in Florida for well over 30 years and are both avid outdoor types. I hung out in these woods in this area for well over 20 years and thought I had heard everything. My wife also. Well, anyway, when we woke up and heard something out on the window, we had a very strong odor of something coming through. My wife and I looked at each other with looks on our face with wonder. We both said it at the same time. What's out there? And right as we said that, this thing shrieked an almost human-sounding cry, but a real wild shriek. I was going to send our lab and pit bull after it, but we could not get them out of our room. They'd never been scared of anything. Then, I went to check on our little girl. She slept through it. When this thing screamed in our window, to reach the window from the outside, 
it would have had to have been at least seven feet tall. We did not dare go outside, especially since our dogs wanted no part of whatever it was. Also, this is a second story from a lifelong Florida native. He said one night, his younger son woke him up, said something was at his window. He told him he's just dreaming. A few minutes later, his son said again, Dad, something is at the window. He couldn't believe his son because his house sits up very high off the ground on blocks for the rainy season that we have here in Florida. This particular area floods very easily. He told me he went into the area in his son's room and could see on the window something left its breath on the window. It was winter, so he did see some condensation on the window, which sits about seven to eight feet off the ground. The dad went and grabbed his shotgun, ran outside with his three hunting dogs. He said, something very large standing upright with a very strong odor ran off to the back side of his property into a very thick swampy area. He did not shoot at it because he wasn't sure what it was. He told me his hunting dogs were under the house and it took him a few hours to get his hunting dogs to come out from under the house. This area is on the other side near Miyaka State Park. The directions to this location is out east on Fruitville Road. Go to the end, turn right, and go a few miles. The back entrance to the park is just a few turns in the road. Also, he said it made a wild shrieking sound also, and this area is pretty much just swamp. He said it was around the early 1980s. He too was an avid hunter, and never in his life saw anything like it. Also, he said his dogs have never gone to the area that this thing ran off to, ever again. This individual believes they saw a skunk ape. On the night of September 9th, 2014, she was driving from Sarasota, east on Highway 72, towards Arcadia, around 8.30 p.m. The sun had set that night at 7.21 it was still twilight. Highway 72 in this area is an undivided two-lane road. No streetlights are present and passes through the Miyaka River State Park, woods and swamp. Google Earth simply will reveal a lot. Just after crossing over Horse Creek, this individual caught movement to the right, south of the road. She began to slow down because she caught a glimpse of a deer. As the car got closer, she no longer saw the deer, but a Bigfoot. The Bigfoot was not deer colored, which was what she initially noticed when she first slowed down, but black instead, bipedal and much larger. She is not sure where the deer ran to, but the Bigfoot took her attention and proceeded across the road in front of her the Bigfoot turned and looked at her as it ran less than 15 feet in front of her car and crossed in a two-step like leap, moving right to left. It seemed to duck into the scrub once it was across. If she had not stepped hard on the brakes, she felt she would have hit it. She said that the Bigfoot seemed to run in front of her, purposefully, as if it were playing chicken. She did not see the deer again, stating that it was a completely different color, shape, and size than the Bigfoot, and she had no doubt that she saw that too. She described the Bigfoot as having black, shaggy hair, and emphasized, shaggy, not fluffy. It was like a dog. She told me it was huge, a comment she made several times. I can't figure out how they stay hidden when they are so large. So I asked her how tall she thought it was, and admitted not being good at guessing, but her father is 6'5", and it was much taller than him. She went on to describe the shoulders as being as wide as my mama's dodge. She described the face as very human-looking, with tan-colored leathery skin, a very flat nose, and dark eyes. 
She drove 20 yards or so past it and pulled off the road. She got out of her car, heard nothing, but smelt a strong, musky swamp odor. She called several of her own children and told them what she had just witnessed. Several days later, I met her at home, met her children. Her son commented how she called them that night, telling them what she had seen. I questioned her on getting her out of her car. I have never spoken to a witness that showed such courage. She said she didn't think about it and didn't feel fear immediately. She was just so shocked to have seen something that wasn't real. She didn't consider the danger until a few moments later when she looked down, noticed a stick that could have been a snake. She admitted to being frightened of snakes, and that is what made her realize she should leave. She admitted that after thinking about it, apprehensiveness set in, and she had not driven that road since. She was even a bit nervous to return with me. I brought a book with pictures of dog breeds, as she couldn't think of the type of dog that had the similar fur. She scanned through the book and pointed to a golden retriever. The fur was like this, this length, but black. The witness and I then drove to the location. She repeated her encounter to me, reiterated that it really seemed to her as if the Bigfoot purposefully left in front of her car when it did not have to. As we drove to the location, she kept saying how huge it was, claimed to know that it was a Bigfoot the moment she saw it. She admitted to not believing they were real creatures prior to seeing it. She admitted to not knowing very much about Sasquatch and asked more questions than any witness I have ever interviewed. There are cow pastures and orange grove in the immediate area. There have also been many other skunk ape sightings around the same area. This was another individual who was driving to work in the dark at about 5.15 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. He was southbound on Markham Woods Road, nearing State Road 434. He was passing a church on the left when he noticed what he thought was an upended couch that somebody had dumped on the other side of the road. As he neared it, he realized that it was actually a hairy figure that was squatting, and it suddenly stood up, facing him. He passed it so closely, his mirror almost hit it. It never tried to step aside as he approached. He checked the rearview mirror once, he passed it, and the figure was no longer there. When he passed in the car, he was only able to see the chest, arm through his closed window. The witness is tall, about 6'4", and can stand near his truck with his head reaching the window. The figure he witnessed was indeed much taller than him, as the arm and chest were only visible. The witness states that it clearly wasn't a bear, and at the time he thought, but Bigfoot doesn't exist. Its hair seemed about six inches long and was mixed brown with some white in color. It was muscular and the chest was very wide. The area isn't an area you would expect to see a Bigfoot until you look at a satellite photo of the area. It's heavily wooded and the homes are set apart and amongst the woods. The little river that runs parallel to the road just a few hundred feet away from it is on the other side of I-4. This river flows out of a buffer conservation area, which has also been subject to many sightings. The church and the rest area near the sightings have dumpsters. From the witness's description, it seemed the creature was heading towards the river. This incident occurred after my husband Myself and our three children and I had moved up to some land that we purchased on Sugarloaf Mountain, west of Boulder, Colorado. My husband at the time managed a tavern and had purchased the five-acre silver mining claim for a song from at the bar and on a paper napkin. We built a tiny 12 by 16 cabin and squeezed ourselves in there on the south side of the mountain about two-thirds of the way along the original little mining road. The cabin was on only level land on a heavily treed and rocked parcel. 
the north side of the cabin snugged right up against the mountain slope, with pine trees all around. That side was two plywood sections high, which would have put it a hair over 16 feet. We had an oversized plywood platform, bunk bed in the northeast corner of the cabin, which we adults and our baby daughter on the first level, and the two boys on the upper level. We put in a little window up there for them, for air, and put in an inside shutter on it, so they could close it when it got really cold, which sometimes it did. It did reach 40 below the very first winter we were there. I think it was during the second autumn there, so it would have been 1971. Our then five-and-a-half-year-old son claimed he had heard the sound of footsteps in the early evening after hearing a really strange sound, definitely an animal, but he had no words at that age to describe it. He said that it sounded like a call of some sort, and bigger than an owl. Some kind of hooting, I guess. Then, he heard some noises close by, rustlings, etc. When he looked up, through the open shutter window, he explained that he looked right into the face of a monster. All I know for sure is that I'll certainly never forget his terrified screams. When he did calm down, he described it as dark and very hairy and a funny face and glowing eyes. It turned and ran away as soon as he began screaming. His brother, two years older, slept through the entire incident until his brother's shrieks woke us all. With the ground sharply slanted up, we figured something would have to have been just about seven to eight feet tall to peer up into that upper window. Not being trained trackers, we found no evidence the next day. But our son, who at this time is now almost 35, swears to this day that it was Bigfoot that he saw. And I have always believed him, since there was no way in the world that, at his age, he could have made up that precise and auditory and visual image or his terror. He came over and visited us this morning. I told him about the article in the Post, and he reiterated his story. He says the image of the face has never left him, and probably never will. My name is Leona. My son, his wife, a friend, and I saw a Sasquatch on August 10th of 1990, 11 a.m., on a bright sunny day in Larimer County, Roosevelt National Forest, about 25 miles just northwest of Fort Collins. I suppose the nearest highway would be Highway 34. That goes through Loveland, about 20 miles away. We had bought a small piece of property and were building a bridge across Buckhorn Creek. We took a break, and my son, Dallas, was skinning a mountain to the west of us with his binoculars when he saw it. My daughter-in-law grabbed the binoculars and looked, and she said, It's chasing some deer. Then, oh my goodness, Mom, it's got knees. She said it ran into a group of pine trees. I got my binoculars, and we stood, quietly, and waited. Several moments go by, and it leapt out from the trees and went running across the face of the mountain. I swear, that thing could run like the wind. And this was rugged terrain. But it had a very strange, distinctive gait. The friend that was with us saw it without binoculars. I guarantee you it was not a fake. There is zero possibility that it could have been. No human could run that fast, especially in a costume, if this was, and especially across that rugged mountain, and it was at least seven feet tall. What is puzzling is that it did not seem to fit with things I have read about them. This one was pitch black, not reddish brown, and it was seen in bright daylight. It was the middle of the day. It was chasing deer, which I thought would rule out it being a vegetarian. 
Another thing that I thought was very interesting was that a huge bird, perhaps a vulture of some kind, kept circling around where the thing was. Like maybe it was waiting for it to make a kill. My son insisted that it had a tuft of snow white hair on its head. We didn't report the sighting because, well, we didn't think anybody would believe us. Plus, we didn't want some gun-happy nuts trying to hunt it down. My husband and I have been living out here ever since that time, and we've been staring at the same mountain for years, but we've never seen another one. Nevertheless, I feel truly blessed that I got the chance to see one of these creatures that are apparently so elusive and by many claim don't exist. In 1971, I saw some very large footprints in the snow in the summer high in Colorado wilderness area. These prints were at least half again as big as a human footprint, and the stride length was much longer than any human, at least four feet or longer. They looked exactly like human prints. They were not bare. I recognized those they proceeded across several small remaining snow patches on a mountainside meadow. There were about a dozen or more clear prints. I saw none on the ground between the snow. The ground was firm and damp. I saw no other suggestive evidence, but was not searching for any. I was scared and wanted to get out of there ASAP. I wondered if they may have been human, and had enlarged, spread out by heating and melting, cooling and refreezing. That does occur at that time of year, in the little snow patches. But the detail was fairly preserved, and one would think that any melting and refreezing would blur those details. The possibility of this phenomenon should be closely examined. Somebody should walk through the summer snow patches barefooted, then observe the prints for a number of days during the summer when this melt and refreeze process does occur. If the enlarging of the prints and spreading of the stride does not occur, I assume these prints I saw were clearly not human. If they do spread out, maybe somebody just walked through there barefooted. I wondered if it was a hoax, but the area was quite remote, and the perpetrator would have to know somebody would pass that exact spot. I don't recall if we were on an established trail or just wandering near our campsite. Also, if it was a hoax, why would they put the prints in the snow, since one could not predict exactly when it would melt in the unpredictable summer weather? I have no particular interest in the existence of Sasquatch, but as a scientist, I am curious Having seen these prints with my own eyes, I definitely believe it is possible. There were two friends who were with me, and we all saw the same thing. I am now 46 years of age, and was in high school at the time that I saw this. We normally walk our dog off lead, but entering the start of the hike, at the west entrance, my wife and dog were immediately on high alert. My wife wanted our dog on lead, as she was spooked. By the way, this was the western side of the railroad grade trail, above Chalk Lake. So, after approximately a quarter mile, I noticed animal droppings that appeared large human-shaped under the uphill undergrowth, spaced every 10 to 20 feet. I even commented on the size and shape of the droppings with my wife, and we agreed. They couldn't be human, as there were too many, and under the branches of the uphill side. We discussed how they appeared to be marking a territory. The droppings continued for maybe 150 feet. We continued down east on the trail. At about the half-mile mark, a deer startled us, running from the uphill side across the trail and down the other. My wife was spooked, and we turned around to go back. As we neared the spot where the droppings were, 
I spotted a single footprint on the uphill side, partially hidden by branches. I took pictures using my water bottle and shoe, size 10 for comparison. I wanted to spend more time, but my wife and dog were very agitated. I spent five minutes searching for a rock or a log or anything that would fit in the form of the print, thinking it must have been a rock to have left such a deep, clear impression. No such luck. We left in a hurry. There was also no unusual smells. No other bikers or hikers on the trail that day. Our dog was, for whatever reason, on high alert the entire time. He is a Kelpie cattle dog. Very intelligent. Very well trained. And very intuitive to his surroundings. We all have spent time hiking in bear country. And are very comfortable in the bush. There's no other reason why our dog would be on such high alert. Something was with us that day, or close by. On Thursday, July 25th, my girlfriend and I were hiking in Mayflower Basin, south of Colorado 91. We were up in the basin, and Helen had gone ahead to the foot of the basin, I was about a hundred yards off the three minor log cabin remnants, sitting on a rock, enjoying some peanuts and water, when, looking west, I saw a very large brown biped approach the snow wall, cornice, and seek to climb it. The biped was unable to climb up over twenty feet, moved back down laterally to its right, and then down to the ground off the snow. It then walked on two legs very briskly to the right, subsequently out of my view. About four to five minutes later, a hiker with his dog came walking down the trail, and I later saw this brown biped from time to time, walking above the snow southbound. I did not see it again. Helen had returned to me, and we discussed, then walked down to the locked gate, prohibiting cars into the basin to talk with the hiker. His name was Robbie, his dog Dallas. We agreed to scale up the trail to where I had seen the brown biped. Helen took longer, but Robbie and I reached the area, found handprints in the snow and an arc, one print lower with three big fingers and one thumb. Footprints were not descriptive of toes, arch, and heel. We took photos and were sheriff interested. We then traversed to right, north, on difficult terrain. That is quite slanted, where the biped moved quickly and appearing easily. No further sighting. This was now about 2.30 p.m., when I had seen the biped at about 1.45. Returning back to the dirt road and the parking lot by bushwhacking the forest. Also, the brown biped sought to scale snow wall tried only once, then moved laterally to ride off snow. Then, when Robert and I got there, it was very hard for us to traverse. He is a 47 Gulf War veteran. I and six, and even with two ski poles for stability, was very hard to traverse. This story that I'm about to share with you occurred all the way back in 2007 when I was visiting Yellowstone, along with some of my friends who were also interning there at the time, hence why I came to visit. A few of them got to go on to do search and rescue, while others, whom I believe just helped maintain peace and integrity in the park. And during my visit, my friends, whom I'll keep their names anonymous, were just beginning their internship. During the time, I really knew nothing about park rangers, other than them sitting in a tower or an office all day, or boringly patrolling around the entire park, looking for mischief, or maybe teenagers who weren't doing what they were supposed to. But little did I know that it would have everything and anything to deal with things that go bump in the night, or things of a more supernatural nature. I wasn't exactly camping with my friends who were interning, even though they were there with me. They had job stuff to do. So much of it involved me actually just kind of camping out by myself, 
while getting to hang out with them during the daytime, which was fine by me. I still had a lot of fun. But at nighttime, and keep in mind this wasn't my first camping experience, not only have I gone camping out in the woods by myself, but also in campgrounds with friends, family, and solo adventures, I have never experienced anything weird or out of the ordinary, so this whole thing was a first for me. On the very first night, I awoke to a strange light outside my tent. It was actually roughly 10 to 20 feet up in the air, right above my tent. I woke up and was very startled, thinking somebody was hanging a lantern or something. But after unzipping my tent and looking up, it appeared to be this bright orb, or what I can only describe, roughly the size of a tennis ball, just emanating a very soft, pale blue light. And just as soon as it appeared, it vanished, like somebody flicking the lights out. That definitely freaked me out. I ran back inside my tent and hid there as best I could from anything and really didn't get that great of sleep that night. But can you blame me? So the following day, I told my friends about it, the ones who had just started interning, and they both were quiet. They didn't say much about it. These were the same kind of guys who would mock me and make fun of me had I ever brought up aliens or UFOs or anything ghost-related. To have them be this quiet was very strange. But the day and the time did go on. So, as it did, the second night came. And this time, I was hoping I wouldn't see any strange balls of light. Now, at this time, I did not believe in UFOs, ghosts, or anything of that nature at all, actually. I don't know if I would have considered myself an atheist. Probably more agnostic than anything. But the idea of aliens or UFOs just seemed so far-fetched. Even though I couldn't exactly explain a tennis ball-sized orb of light directly above my tent the night before, I still wasn't about to admit to alien life. And, although I told my friends, they offered no input other than uncomfortable glances staring down at the ground, trying to avoid any sort of reply they could. This just weirded me out more than it made me feel uncomfortable. So, as I was saying, the second night came, and instead of any orbs of light, I was greeted with very strange sounds far off in the distance. It sounded like King Kong, or some sort of crazy primate, except the sounds were much, much deeper. Now, I know in Yellowstone, there are all sorts of wildlife throughout. I mean, this entire state is very popular for that. But this just sounded like nothing from what I could ever imagine hearing. There's nothing in the United States wilderness, to me, that resembles the sound of a gorilla, or any sort of primate whatsoever, especially ones with lungs that large, and a voice that deep. I wasn't sure what to make of it, but it only appeared here and there, not all throughout the night, but parts, very minimal, and only when I was awake. So nothing happened and startled me awake, thank goodness. The following day came and went, and I never discussed in any detail whatsoever about the previous night that occurred with my friends. These sounds that I heard, although strange and were a little alarming, wasn't a deal-breaker for me to leave. I tried to suppress any feelings I had about these weird things happening, considering, well, you know, they're not exactly normal. The third night, I had a pretty good night of sleep. Actually, I slept better than I have in months, it felt like. I slept like a rock, probably for around 12 hours, to be exact. The following day, same thing. Friends hung out, we did stuff just like every other day, and on the fourth night, I slept again great. Now, it was the fifth and final day and night is when stuff got a little out of hand. See, right before I turned in for the evening, a gentleman from a few campsites over came to me and said, Hey, I don't mean to be alarming, but a little earlier, I saw a large bear, or what I thought to be a bear, walking upright, heading in your campsite's direction. I told him thank you, and I would closely be on the lookout. 
he walked away. And right then, I wasn't exactly sure if the Yellowstone even had grizzly bears in the area, but that he obviously had some sort of bear sighting, and I should keep my eyes peeled. Well, I never saw anything until it was time for bed. I feel it's also important, too, to make note that in Yellowstone, I was in the Madison campground, which I think is the most northern part of the campground site, and there was actually very few people in it during this week, probably because this was through a Monday and Friday, at least I can assume. There was a decent amount of people, but it was nowhere near full. In fact, I only had a few other people near my site, and by near, I mean several spots over, so I definitely had privacy, and at times during the night, this occurred to me every night, I would have to pee really bad, so I'd get up out of my tent, and instead of going to the bathrooms, I would run into the woods, which were close by, and do my business. At 2 o'clock in the morning, with nothing but a headlamp, it managed to work pretty good, because, well, you're surrounded in darkness, and nobody else around is looking for you, so it's nice. And that's exactly the perfect segue to take you into exactly what happened. I get up on the very fifth night, probably one in the morning, and head over to the same trees that I've been going to every other night. But this time, as I'm approaching it, something felt off, and in my sleep stupor, I never once thought about the orb of light, or the weird gorilla noises I was hearing, or just how I managed to get the best night of sleep in my life the other few nights. And instead, I felt a very familiar feeling, like I was being watched from the woods, like the direction I was going to was dangerous. The bathrooms were easily double the distance in the opposite direction, which is why I went for the woods anyway. But I just said screw it, and kept going into the woods. I only went maybe 10 feet in, and at that point, I unzipped myself, being very alert to the sounds and things around me. And even though I was still feeling watched, I couldn't exactly see a source of who was watching me. I did have my headlamp on, a one that just wraps around your head. I'm not talking about a full helmet headlamp. So I was looking around and couldn't see anything until I turned just enough to my right and I was met with a reflection of eyes on a very large dark shape. It almost appeared to be gorilla-like, but not quite. It was man-like as well. It's really hard to tell when you're in the forest because there's brush and trees in the way, but all I saw was the eye reflection attached to a large black silhouette, the shape of a gorilla or a man, but much, much bigger. I screamed, quickly zipped up midstream, and ran back to my tent as fast as I could. Unsure of what to do. Should I tell somebody? Should I try and protect myself? I wasn't sure. So I hid in my tent the rest of the night. Again, just like the first night with the orb. Except this time way more terrified. Had I just seen a Bigfoot? I wasn't sure. But I had seen something. I didn't sleep at all that night either. And the morning came. I felt my adrenaline was really wearing low and I felt exhausted. I feel like I had to call my trip quits, since this was the day I was planning on leaving anyway. I met up with my buddies, hopped up on at least three cups of coffee, just to try and endure my lack of sleep. I came clean and told them what I saw last night, and just like after the first night, they both went quiet, and then asked me if I could keep something on the down low. I agreed, they both pulled me aside, and they both told me that on their first couple days, they saw really weird things in the sky, orbs, triangles, strange shapes they can't identify, black, dark, huge humanoid silhouettes running through the woods, yellow glowing eyes, chasing them, running parallel, all sorts of super freaky fictionist stuff, except in their case, they were terrified when retelling it. And these dudes are dudes I went to high school with. Dudes who are super serious. Science diehards. The kind of guys who, as I told you earlier, would make fun of you 
if you ever said you knew or saw a ghost. These guys were absolutely scared, and I've never seen them so scared in my life. But I asked them, is the job worth it? And they said yes, because it only happened a few times. But obviously me bringing it up made them very uncomfortable, and almost served as a reminder to them that it's a very real part of their job. Now, if we fast forward now to 2020, both of them, to my knowledge, are still working as full-time park rangers. Although with COVID, I'm not exactly sure how that's worked out for much of the environmental field of work. Maybe they're not working there anymore. I think the one stayed with Yellowstone up until at least 2020. Again, I'm assuming COVID has put a dent in things. The other one I think eventually transferred or moved states. I'm not sure. Maybe to Pennsylvania or New York. Possibly Virginia. I lost contact with him. But as far as I know, he still works as a ranger. Because they both just enjoy the work, I guess. And even though there is weird things to the job, they love the sights. They love the sounds. And ultimately, they loved being immersed in nature 24-7 as a part of their occupation. Even though sometimes that occupation has some very strange payoffs that you have to do. I guess the question here is, did they see the same thing I did? Because when they told me about their experiences, I didn't have much to say. I mean, conversation kind of just passed and changed subjects. But I think about it from time to time. And listening to your Bigfoot encounters and your park ranger stories always brings me back to that week. I wonder if I too saw a Sasquatch out there I know nothing of the Bigfoot population in Yellowstone, or if that even is such a thing. And I also wonder, did my two friends see Bigfoots? I'm not exactly sure. I mean, for all I know, there could be a clan of them living out here. And maybe, just maybe, one was curious enough to sneak up on me that night to see what I was doing. When I said I was feeling watched, there wasn't a feeling of danger, like hostile behavior or that I was going to die. Maybe, assuming how Bigfoots are, I was just being observed. When I shone my headlamp that night and saw the silhouette, it was probably somewhere 30 to 50 feet away, behind some trees and brush. And this was June, after all, which is yet another reason I was so surprised that even though during the week, it was so empty compared to normal. Even my friends made that comment, that they figured there'd be a lot more people, which, again, would also make sense that there wouldn't be as much activity or sightings. More people, less Bigfoot around, assuming that's what I saw. Anyway, I don't want to try and jumble all my words here. Please don't hesitate if you have any questions. I would love to get you answers as soon as I can.